Hello everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, prelude for the upcoming monsoon edition of uh, the 20th MRI teaching course. As we all know, this is one of the much awaited annual conferences uh, and this is the 20th year. And this is a conference where we cover everything from basics to advances in MRI. And last year we shifted from the on-site uh, pattern to the online platform which gave us a lot of opportunity to expand and a lot of flexibility as well. So though uh, there were issues and a lot of new challenges with the ongoing pandemic, we have uh, with us this online platform giving us the flexibility to learn at our own pace and at our, at our own space. So uh, this year also the 20th MRI teaching course will be a comprehensive course and uh, we are happy to inform that we have expanded it from a three day format to even better five day format. And we are also having preludes in between. As we understand that uh, MRI is a vast topic in itself and it takes years to understand and uh, gain the knowledge. but to cover the topics in these few days is really difficult. Therefore, uh, the physics part of it and anatomy, we have kept as separate sessions two days. 7th of August, we'll have the sessions uh, dealing with the physics topics specifically directed to our uh, residents who have just joined radiology. We'll have basics and advances in MR sequences. We learn about MR artifacts. We learn about MRI safety, MRI coils, which are used three Tesla, 1.5 Tesla, the differences, etc. This will be on 7th of August, Saturday evening. The second day will be a detailed MRI anatomy, which will be on Sunday, 8th of August. And here we are going to cover the basics of neuro and MSK anatomy. As we know that before we start understanding the pathologies, uh, we should understand the anatomy because that is how we are going to learn to identify the difficult cases in our practice. So we'll have a short focus session on anatomy like uh, anatomy of mid-sag brain, anatomy of CSF spaces, cranial nerves anatomy, neurovascular anatomy. And then we'll have it followed by anatomy of knee, shoulder, ankle, elbow, and wrist joints. We'll have uh, our expert team dealing with these topics, uh, including uh, our mentor, Dr. Deepak Patkar, sir, and uh, Dr. Malini Lavande, who everyone knows, uh, whoever is dealing with MSK imaging. Uh, then Dr. Divyata, Dr. Ravi Thapar, Dr. Amit Chaudhary, Dr. Gayatri, Dr. Harshad, and many more. Next day will be a full day session on neuroimaging topics, which will cover everything, including infections, including neurodegenerative spectrum, including everything uh, like COVID-19, mucor mycosis, then updates on brain tumors, pediatric and adults, updates on advances like perfusion, DTI, spectroscopy, and also something like uh, cellar, paracellar areas or vital pathologies and stroke and update. With this, uh, we'll move to the next session, which will be completely dedicated to MSK topics. And uh, there we'll have all everything beyond anatomy because anatomy we'll already see on 8th of August. So this session will deal with uh, the detailed MRI in knee, shoulder, ankle, wrist in approach to uh, tumor like lesions in soft tissues as well as in osseous structures and followed by some advances like peripheral neuropathies, uh, cartilage imaging, etc. And then we'll have a complete day on body imaging topics, which will cover uh, basics of cardiac imaging, basics of breast imaging using MRI. Then we'll have sessions on liver lesions covering benign liver pathologies, then the chronic liver disease, how to report, and then how to identify and report as per the LIRADs. Then we'll go to session on PIRADS as well, that is multi-parametric MRI of prostate. We'll have sessions which will be focused on gynac malignancies and some sessions on MRI defecography, enterography like techniques. So hopefully uh, with this course, we offer you whatever best can be made in a short day conference on MRI. And all these topics are online so you can attend as per your flexible schedule at your own space. And these will also be provided after the course gets over for at least a month. Uh, we have uh, an honor to have with us the international faculty members as well as they uh, acknowledged and also uh, came forward to support us. 
to this noble cause of teaching and spreading education. So we have uh, Dr. Jain Narang, Dr. Ashish Chavla on board, Dr. Vinil Shah, Dr. Ankit Tandon, Dr. Manjari Dige, Kaurang Shah Sir, Asim Lahiri, Dr. Jim Wu, Dr. Kedar Jambekar, Dr. Rajan Jain, and Dr. Raj Kedar, as well as many more editions. And as always, uh, the most important part of any conference are our delegates. So we require your support and uh, we call for submissions for papers and posters, uh, if possible, related to MRI topics. And the last date of submission is 1st of August. Guidelines are very simple. You have to uh, send us in a PPT format uh, consisting of 15 to 20 slides. Last slide uh, should consist of references and the file size should be 10 MB or less. So you can mail the paper and uh, your posters to this uh, mail ID of irmasterclass at gmail.com. We are thankful to our educational partners, uh, CareStream, Sanrad, Bears, and also to the organizing committee members for their efforts and timely contributions. Uh, Dr. Sanjeev Mani, sir, Dr. Deepak Patkar, sir, Dr. Jignesh Thakkar, Dr. Shailendra Singh, uh, myself, Dr. Mitusha Verma, uh, my colleague, Dr. Kauri Ahuja, and uh, the support behind everything, uh, Mrs. Mamta Patkar, ma'am, and Amit Punkar, sir, for the relentless technical support. So with this, let's go ahead to the first topic of uh, this prelude, uh, which is uh, MRI imaging in cholangiocarcinoma. And for this, we have with us Dr. Ashish Chawla, uh, who started his career in radiology from the city of Mumbai, but soon uh, uh, he developed a lot of uh, new uh, avenues. And then he did fellowship in abdominal radiology from University of Colorado, USA a fellowship in cardiothoracic radiology, again from University of Colorado. And he has uh, several uh, textbook chapters to his credits and published around 80 articles. He has been senior consultant at Department of Diagnostic Radiology, uh, Kutet Pua Hospital, Singapore. And he is also diplomat of American Board of Radiology. So we are thankful to you, sir, for sharing your knowledge and for your time and contribution. Let's begin with the first session of the day. I'm Dr. Ajit Shawla, and I'm going to speak about MR imaging of collective carcinoma of this because so I will discuss the imaging spectrum differential diagnosis of collective carcinoma <laughs> and the limitation of imaging of binary structures. The collective carcinoma is the most common primary binary tract malignancy, a second most common primary hepatic tumor after hepatocellular carcinoma seen worldwide, most common in North Thailand, where it is due to association with liver flukes infection, and it is seen twice more frequently in males compared to the... So these are the risk factors of cholangiocarcinogenesis, parasitic infection, as the liver flukes I just talked about, primary skull losing cholangitis, cholelithiasis, biliary disorders like cholelocal cyst, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and cirrhosis, uh, as well as lifestyle-related uh, risk factors. I won't go into the details of cholangiocarcinogenesis. So these uh, slides will be there in your PDF. So hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and liver cirrhosis, they are common risk factor for developing cholangiocarcinoma and hepatocellular carcinoma, so be, be aware of that. Many times clinician was the answer whether the patient with cirrhosis has cholangiocarcinoma or hepatocellular carcinoma, so that's the role of the radiology become very good. So coming to the anatomical classification, the cholangiocarcinoma can be divided into peripheral intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, Higher intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma extending from the insertion of the cystic duct to the second order bile duct, and then the extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, uh, as shown in this illustration. More important for us is to know the morphological classification of cholangiocarcinoma. These can be divided into mass forming cholangiocarcinoma. So, the mass forming cholangiocarcinoma they tend to invade into the liver parenchyma, they tend to arbitrate. Uh, uh, the portal vein without invading into it, uh, whereas the second type, periductal infiltrating type, they tend to grow along the bile duct, so they usually present with long structures and dilatation. Uh, 
The third type, the intralectal type, it grows into the duct as a papillary mass, expanding the, uh, the bile duct. This one has the best prognosis. Why the morphology is important? Because it decides the tumor's behavior, surgical approach, clinical outcome, overall prognosis of the patient is decided by the morphology. Uh, workup of the patient, biochemical workup, serum CA99 information is quite useful in differentiating the cholangiocarcinoma from hepatocellular carcinoma. As I said, that the patient with cholangiocarcinoma cirrhosis can go either way, either cholangiocarcinogenesis or, uh, or they can develop hepatocellular carcinoma. But be careful, patients with benign biliary disease can also have high CA99. So the mass forming cholangiocarcinoma, usually they are irregular mass, lobular mass with well-defined margin. In the periphery of the tumor, there are abundant tumor cells. In the central area, there are the necrosis, fibrosis, and myosin. Hypointense on T1 and heterogeneously bright on T2 image. Enhancement pattern is quite characteristic. In the arterial phase, they show peripheral thin rim of enhancement with progressive centripetal enhancement in the subsequent phases. And the delayed phase, there is more intense enhancement. They are predominantly hypointense on the hepatobiliary phase. And I'll talk more about it, some interesting signs on the hepatobiliary phase. The ancillary features are quite useful sometimes in differential diagnosis. As I mentioned, the cholangiocarcinoma tend to encase the portal vein instead of invading as a tumor thrombus. They may be associated with biliary dilatation, low bar atrophy, capsule retraction, and some other ancillary feet. This is a very interesting sign, cloud sign. So this is seen in patients with the cholangiocarcinoma uh, in the hepatobiliary phase. So the central area of the tumor is bright in hepatobiliary phase, and the peripheral is Periphery is hypo-intense. That is called cloud sign. Here is an example of a cloud sign which we reported in this journal. But this is not specific for uh, cholangiocarcinoma. It can be seen in metastasis from the mucinous tumors. Another sign is the target sign, which is more specific sign of cholangiocarcinoma. So in the high B value diffusion major images, there is bright signal here because of the high tumor cells, where in the center area there is dark signals because of the fibrosis or necrosis. This is seen only in the high B value images. This is quite useful sign practically to differentiate small hepatocellular carcinoma from the cholangiocarcinoma. So this is seen in the cholangiocarcinoma. So the first case here, T2 fat site images show a heterogeneous mass on the in the in the liver and it shows heterogeneous T2 bright signals. So the central area is more bright, the periphery is not so bright. In the high B value images and ADC images, clearly there's a cloud sign, so the, there is darkness only in the periphery of the tumor, and uh, uh, in the central area is more of a T2 shine through effect, so this is, sorry, it's a target sign is present. It's hypo, the tumor is hypo intense on T1 white images, in the arterial phase, classical peripheral rim-like enhancement, and in the venous phase and three-minute and five-minute delayed phase, there is progressive enhancement. See, the enhancement in this area becomes more dense with the time lapses. And in the hepatobiliary phase, what we are seeing is classical cloud sign. So this is how a cholangiocarcinoma looks like, classical cholangiocarcinoma. Everything specific is present about it in the cholangiocarcinoma. Sometimes even a single image is quite diagnostic of cholangiocarcinoma, so I'm showing that. Uh, this is a patient who has a mass which is showing heterogeneous enhancement. There is peripheral capsular retraction, there is uh, attenuation of the portal vein, it's not invaded, see there is compression of the portal vein, there is associated peripheral ductal dilatation, so one image Quite uh, confidently, I can say that this is probably most likely cholangiocarcinoma. Another example: a 58-year-old man with hepatitis B and cirrhosis. CT scan shows in the portovenous phase a mass here. So the question again: whether this is cholangiocarcinoma and or hepatocellular carcinoma? MR shows throws a lot of light uh, in, on this case. Let's see that MR of this patient. So on T2 fat site images, the 
the mass is heterogeneous, mildly bright on uh, in the periphery and dark on this in the center. And on the diffusion major images, it's bright. I'm not showing the ADC because of the lack of space here on my slide, but it was dark on ADC, so there is restricted diffusion. Look at this component of the mass. It is extending into a tubular structure, either it's a portal lane or it is a duct. So see that it's bright, it's bearing same as, uh, as a primary mass. On, hypo, on T1 weighted images, this mass is hypo intense. In the arterial phase, there is barely any enhancement in the mass, but there is some heterogen enhancement, very mild uh, enhancement in the mass. In the venous phase and the delayed phases, there is progressive and in, uh, a more denser enhancement in the mass, as well as this component which is extending here. So this is extending here. Uh, there is uh, there are ancillary features here. The duct is dilated here and there is capsular retraction. Happy to biliary phase, the mass washes out. And if you move more caudal slices, the, this component which we were analyzing is not going into the portal vein and the portal vein is here on this side and the mass is here. And it's actually extending into the, into the right duct. So all these features are favoring the, a diagnosis of cholangiocarcinoma. So quite comfortably, I can tell my clinician that this is not hepatoma, this is cholangiocarcinoma. A differential diagnosis, as I said, in the clinical practice, it's quite uh, it's a common query how to differentiate a cholangiocarcinoma from hepatocellular carcinoma. So in my, this is a chart I got it in my experience, this presence of fat is quite useful. When the fat is present, it's more likely hepatocellular carcinoma because I have not seen fat really in cholangiocarcinomas in the literature they have described though. Then the capsule in the delayed phase is seen in cholangiocarcinoma, uh, in, in the hepatocellular carcinoma and not in the cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, diffusion weighted images, as I mentioned, is uh, they can be target-like appearance, if it's, when it's present, it's quite useful. Portal vein involvement is typic uh, typically in hepatocellular carcinoma, there is tumor thrombus, whereas in cholangiocarcinoma, there's encasement of the portal vein rather than tumor extension. Then the duct may be dilated in cholangiocarcinoma, uh, whereas in only large hepatocellular carcinoma, the ducts are dilated. Another example, a 54-year-old man with hepatitis B, again, the question is same whether this is a hepatoma or cholangiocarcinoma. MRI, let us see the MRI, what it shows. So on MRI, this lesion is mildly bright, but quite well demarcated on T2 fat site images. In the, there's a lot of information in the in the G1 weighted images. So in the out of phase image, the, the tumor looks more darker, there is signal loss, suggesting that there is fat inside the mass. And this is bright on high B value images. And I'm not showing the diffusion, but it was dark on diffusion, so there was presence of diffusion. And in the arterial phase, there is very mild enhancement compared to the unenhanced white images. Not the typical enhancement pattern of hepatocellular carcinoma. But what is interesting is that in the three minute delayed phase and the hepatopillary phase, there is a peripheral capsule formation. So we have two evidence towards. Uh, hepatocellular carcinoma and then the further evidence comes from the biochemical workup of the patient. The patient's alpha fetoprotein level was more than 400 whereas the CA90 was not high. So comfortably, we can, again, we gave a diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma. This tumor was resected and it, the final diagnosis was well differentiated hepatocellular car. A rare differential diagnosis of mass forming cholangiocarcinoma is hemangioma, not the classical hemangioma, but the sclerosing hemangioma. The classical hemangioma typically has peripheral nodal enhancement in the arterial phase and uh, which moves centripetally. Whereas in the sclerosing hemangioma, the same findings are present, but they are delayed. So in the arterial phase, there is nothing, but in the venous phase, there is peripheral nodal enhancement. And in the even in the quite late phase, there may not be complete filling up of the tumor of the hemangioma because of the fibrosis uh, uh, element present in the center of the hemangioma. So in the clinical practice, again, it becomes sometimes difficult. This key is helpful. Um, the hemangioma, they don't show any restricted diffusion. The bile ducts are 
never dilated in the presence of hemangioma, epidupillary disease is not that useful. So, an example here, 41 year old man with incidental lesion in, ultra, in, in liver on the ultrasound and the CT scan single phase photovenous phase shows there is a, man, a lesion with the heterogeneous enhancement in the periphery of the right lobe of liver. MR was done for this patient. On fat fat titubated images, the lesion is uh, heterogeneous on uh, uh, slightly bright in the periphery but dark in the center. In phase, out phase, at least confirmed there is no fat, so unlikely hepatocellular carcinoma, no clue for hepatocellular carcinoma. There is no restricted diffusion, quite useful evidence. And in the arterial phase, there is no enhancement. In the venous phase, there is peripheral mild enhancement. In the delayed phase, there is centripetal moving of contrast. And finally, in the 10 minute delayed phase, the lesion completely enhancing. In the habitability phase, there is some nodular patchy enhancement in this patient. So again, uh, it's more favoring the sclerosing hemangioma because there is no restricted diffusion uh, uh, and there is delayed uh, sort of hema if you uh, enhancement is slightly delayed uh, compared to the classical hemangioma. But in the clinical practice, the decision making, it becomes difficult to uh, call uh, sclerosing hemangioma and sclerosing hemangioma. It's usually a hindsight diagnosis in my clinical practice. So we suggested biopsy. No biopsy was performed in this patient, but this remained stable over nine years when I was following this patient. Almost same as uh, 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 appearance. So we concluded that this is probably a case of sclerosing hemangioma. Definitely cholangiocarcinoma is out of question. And there is no uh, uh, ancillary features here of like capsular retraction or periductal dilatation in this case to suggest uh, cholangiocarcinoma. So yeah, a comprehensive evaluation is important uh, in such case. Okay, this is an interesting case recently encountered, but we have a few more cases like that. A 51-year-old man with sigmoid mucinous malignancy operated a couple of years back. So this patient uh, had undergone a CT scan that showed multiple masses in the liver. We did MR for further evaluation. So on T2 fat set images, there are at least two masses in the liver, one here and one here. They are mildly bright, but not exactly T2 bright. But they have a margin, quite well demarcated. There is restricted diffusion, and if you carefully evaluate the, the diffusion, it is the target sign. The target sign is present. There is the restricted diffusion in the periphery of the mass, uh, and in the central area, it's more of a, a G2 a shine through. Uh, Unenhanced by hypointense, and look at the venous phases and the um, three minute delay and hepatobiliary phase. There is progressive enhancement in both the masses, see this, air, air, and in the hepatobiliary phase, classical cloud sign. So we knew from the history that patient has some using a history of cholangioca, uh, mucinous uh, sigmoid mass. So these are probably metastasis, but uh, uh, and the clinician also knew that this is metastasis, but we have to give a differential diagnosis that maybe these are multifocal cholangiocarcinoma, radiological differential diagnosis, but final diagnosis was confirmed as mucinous metastasis. So uh, learning point is that the mucinous metastasis cannot be sometimes differentiated radiological from cholangiocarcinoma. You have, but that usually this is not the, uh, it's not a question because you always have a history of uh, uh, a mucinous malignancy in breast or uh, colorectal cancer uh, uh, in such patient or with metastasis. Move on to the peridectal infiltrative cholangiocarcinoma. They arise between the second order bile duct and the insertion of the uh, uh, cystic duct. They spread along the bile duct. So, but in practice, a combination of peridectal infiltrative and mass forming tumor is more common. So they usually, the MR feature is of peridectal thickening, which is high point chance on T1. That shows progressive enhancement, typical signature imaging features of cholangiocarcinoma, 
hyper hyper intense on T two weighted images. They are usually associated with ductal dilatation and ductal narrowing. That actually draw your attention towards the mass, the presence of ductal dilatation. And the most important uh, in practice you, uh, is the presence of restricted diffusion in the periductal thickening uh, that uh, uh, makes our confidence high to call it a malignant uh, structure. So here is an example of a patient, 52-year-old man, presented with sepsis and abnormal liver function test, and this is how they usually present. So on the CT scan, single phase photovenous phase, there is just focal ductal dilatation. Nothing else, focal ductal dilatation in the left that portal vein is not thrombose, but it's attenuated, I'll call it. It's, it's compressed, uh, it's, it's narrow in caliber, it's not invaded by the mass. At this, so the MR was done for this patient for further evaluation on MRI. There is ductal dilatation in the left side, and the ducts are not as bright as they should be. They are very cloudy, bright, but they are bright. See here, very difficult to make out, most useful. Restricted diffusion, it was present. I'm not showing again the ADC here uh, because of the lack of space uh, on my slide, but there is bright signals here in the diffusion weighted images. Con on the contrast phases, there is periductal thickening and enhancement. See, along the duct here, along the duct, involving a long segment of the duct, typical example of periductal infiltrative uh, uh, cholangiocarcinoma, and this is how they usually present focal dilatation of the duct, either segmental or lobar, uh, some territorial. So uh, the take-home message is one of the take-home messages to never ignore uh, uh, focal ductal dilatation. Uh, if you see on CT, uh, do for work up on this patient. So this patient came back six months later. Uh, six months later, uh, I have put up the initial CT and follow-up CT side by side, and you can realize six months later, the mass is now quite obvious. So initially it was the ductal, periductal infiltrating mass, now it has become a combination of periductal infiltrating and uh, mass forming cholangiocarcinoma. This is usually the stage when uh, we give the diagnosis, confirm diagnosis of uh, cholangiocarcinoma that is not correct good for the patient because by this time it's inoperable, it's good to diagnose it's quite beneficial to diagnose the cholangiocarcinoma at this stage, and that is possible confidently only by a combination of MR and ERCP, as I have shown with this example. Okay. So, class skin tumor, everybody knows about it. Uh, this is the classification of class skin tumor. Uh, difficult, looks like complicated slide, but the slide uh, is more useful to understand the classification. So, in type 1, only the common hepatic duct is involved without involving the confluence in the type 2. The confluence is also involved in type 3A. The right duct is involved, sparing the left duct. In the type 3B, the left duct is, is involved, the right duct is spared, and the type 4 is inoperable. Both the ductal systems are involved along with the hepatic duct. So this classification is useful for prognostication and for guiding the cell. So 56-year-old man with elevated liver function test and sepsis, there is a, a mass here in the hilum with ductal dilatation bilaterally, uh, the right duct, as well as left duct on T2 haste images. That's showing restricted diffusion. And in the contrast enhancement phases, there is typical signature of cholangiocarcinoma, progressive enhancement. No doubt this is uh, a class skin tumor and uh, the portal vein uh, it was patent in this patient. MRCP is quite useful in these patients in classifying into the bismuth categories. So in this patient, the left duct is well involved and the, the main duct is involved. So this becomes type 3B class in tumor. In this patient, surgery was not performed. Uh, Perperative uh, treatment was given and uh, uh, due to presence of comorbidity. So this is how a class in tumor look like. Now we move on to a common scenario that we face in our clinical practice, biliary structure. So especially the extra hepatic bile duct structure. Uh, I see it every, uh, I mean twice or thrice in every. Here's an example, classical cases, 
58 year old man with jaundice. MRCP shows abrupt cutoff of the dilated duct. Bilateral ducts are dilated. Three minute delayed phase shows that there is some uh, cuff of soft tissue enhancing at the level of uh, cutoff. Axial post contrast delayed images are useful, showing that there is an eccentric soft tissue here, nodule in the, uh, the region of the stricture quite well seen here. So in this patient, since there are presence of two uh, evidence to uh, suggesting the presence of malignancy, uh, so uh, you can comfortably call it a cholangiocarcinoma, which is usually confirmed by MRC, ERCP. So uh, this was a, a confir uh, confirmed after we gave a diagnosis of cholangiocarcinoma. <laughs> Uh, now we move on to the opposite category of the patient, a 60 year old woman with recurrent biliary colic. So in this patient on MRCP, you can see that the ducts are dilated, there are pulse duct uh, calculi, then there is a stretcher. Post contrast, delayed images shows that, uh, that there is a gradual tapering, so the, the gradual narrowing that is not abrupt cut off. On actual images, there is no periductal thickening. What you're seeing here is calculus within the CBD. There is no convincing periductal thickening and there was no restrictive diffusion in this area. So there's no evidence for malignancy. So we'll uh, probably benign, but again, radiologists should be careful calling a benign lesion a benign. Uh, you never know, uh, cannot exclude a, a mucosal uh, cholangiocarcinoma. But you can give uh, just uh, whatever you see, you can describe and uh, favor one diagnosis or other benign versus malignant. So in this case, we call it probably benign, but and the patient underwent again. Uh, this patient was uh, stable for four years. Yeah. <coughs> no, the RCP was done, and we concluded that there is nothing, uh, no malignancy in this patient. So our problem here, and you know, question our clinician asked whether the the bile duct structure is benign or, or malignant. Uh, so final diagnosis usually is with the ERCP. We can suggest, we can look for the evidence. So the evidence for malignancy are presence of periductal thickening, usually eccentric, <coughs> abrupt narrowing, presence of restricted diffusion, but the tumor tissue is so sm uh, small in volume that very difficult to have a restricted diffusion in that area. B9 structure again, it, it takes a lot of experience to call B9 structure, B9 structure, and it's better to leave the decision on the clinician. You can just uh, measure and you report whatever evidence you are collecting towards either of the type. Move on to the third type of cholangiocarcinoma, the intraductal cholangiocarcinoma. So this is usually present like a polyp, has a papillary growth. To in the lumen of the bile duct, and there is no parenchymal extension. This one has the best uh, prognosis uh, because it does not in invade the uh, liver parenchyma. In clinical practice, you encounter them with, as a focal or diffuse ductal dilatation with or without papillary mass, and sometimes as an intraductal cast like lesion with a mildly dilated duct. They have the signature of cholangiocarcinoma that how it looks like so a classical example of a ductal type uh, on t2 haste images there is a mass here smiley bright on uh, on t2 weighted images finally bright on ib value diffusion weighted images it, it was dark on adc so there is restricted diffusion and classical signature uh, enhancement of cholangiocarcinoma progressive in the faces Three minute delayed phase shows that the mass is growing within the duct, expanding the duct, and there is upstream dilatation of the duct, MRCP, not the MRCP, this is T2, probably haste. The mass is located in the in the duct. So this is how the, the intraductal cholangiocarcinoma looks like. ERCP was done in this patient, and uh, cholangiocarcinoma was proven. We, uh, I couldn't follow up this case uh, because of the of certain uh, because the case notes were locked. Sometimes they can be seen on CT scan, like in this case, and in this case, uh, there's an enhancing mass in the CBD. 
uh, anji has proven it is has to be malignancy but in this case it came out as dysplastic villus polyp so there are few other pre malignant lesion described in the literature very rare to pick up uh, prospectively it's usually the benignity is the hindsight diagnosis for us radiologists clinical practice everything enhancing in the cbd is cholangiocarcinoma anji has proven otherwise that i follow that rule coming to the conclusions we must be aware of the, uh, the signature appearance of the cholangiocarcinoma the awareness about the differential diagnosis is essential as i mentioned the mucinex metastasis from colorectal carcinoma we should always seek help from the clinical and lab data and the radiologist this is very important that should have high index of suspicion uh, for cholangiocarcinoma when you are assessing focal stretch intrahepatic or extrahepatic biliary structures don't leave the patient alone follow up those cases if the clinician do ERCP brushing even if this benign i will recommend if you know the patient ask him to follow up uh, uh, maybe 6 month 3 month and you may save some life because this need to be thank you sir for that uh, wonderful session on imaging uh, with mri in cases of cholangiocarcinoma a uh, few questions uh, are coming in the chat box so we'll take the questions uh, at the end of the second uh, lecture and for the second talk uh, we have with us dr alok jaju who is the program director of pediatric neuroradiology fellowship and also radiologist at n robert h chiluri children's hospital chicago assistant professor at northwestern university feinberg school of medicine and sir will be taking us through various cases uh, with interesting diagnosis in pediatric brain thank you sir and let's begin with the session my topic for today is case based review of pediatric brain it's a very broad topic and it's difficult to do a comprehensive review uh, of pediatric brain within 30 minutes so what i'm trying to do is show a couple cases from each of the major etiopathological groups these are less common diagnoses although these are not complete zebras these are uh, conditions which you will encounter in your clinical practice and maybe on your exams um and also all of these conditions have distinctive imaging features that can help you make a very confident diagnosis and thus make a, a difference to the patient care so let's get started the first case is a 8 day old full term neonate who presented with seizures so on the axial and coronal diffusion weighted images in the top row we see these multifocal areas of linear and ovoid a uh, diffusion restriction involving the deep and periventricular white matter of both cerebral hemispheres there is involvement of the corpus callosum there may be mild hyperintensity within the deep nuclei including the globus pallidi and thalamus however otherwise there is no significant um, deep nuclei or brain stem involvement uh, the t2 weighted images are essentially unremarkable partly because of the expected t2 hyperintensity in the white matter at this age related to incomplete myelination So what's the diagnosis here? Is it hypoxic ischemic injury? Is it inborn error of metabolism? Is it related to some kind of infection, or is it related to a thromboembolic phenomenon? So this imaging appearance of this multifocal white matter involvement is characteristic of uh, parechovirus meningoencephalitis. Hypoxic ischemic injury can have white matter involvement, but the lesions are typically more confluent. Inborn errors of metabolism have. more specific patterns of involvement where uh, they involve the deep nuclei and the brain stem more often uh, and thromboembolism would be very unusual at this age and with this presentation so although this imaging shown here is uh, fairly typical of human parechovirus infection it's not entirely specific you could have the same pattern with rotavirus and rotavirus chikungunya and other viral infections the important thing from our standpoint is to is to make a diagnosis of viral encephalitis so that the appropriate treatment can be initiated uh, this typically presents in neonates and infants with most of the cases diagnosed before the age of 1 month once the diagnosis is suspected confirmation is easy by a csf pcr uh, on imaging as we saw here diffusion weighted images are the most sensitive although these lesions can sometimes have associated pedicle hemorrhages of the gradient echo sequences uh, an accurate diagnosis in this scenario can help avoid an extensive metabolic or vascular workup Moving on to the next case, it's a 15-month-old child who presented with altered mental status, recent fever, and a throat swab positive for parainfluenza virus. On the axial and coronal T2-weighted MRI images, we see these expansive areas of T2 hyperintensity involving bilateral thalami, uh, 
and also there is involvement of some corona radiata and the white matter uh, structures on the diffusion weighted images there is a restriction mainly along the periphery of the thalamic lesions with additional diffusion restriction in the in this plenum of corpus callosum and the periventricular white matter on the gradient echo images there is hemorrhage within bilateral thalami pre contrast even weighted images demonstrate low signal within the thalamic lesions and the post contrast even weighted images demonstrate this rim of peripheral enhancement mr venogram was performed which was deemed unremarkable So what's the diagnosis here? Is it related to straight sinus thrombosis? Is it a mitochondrial disorder like Mila's? Is it acute disseminated encephalomyelitis or ADEM? Or is it acute necrotizing encephalopathy? So this imaging appearance is suggestive of acute necrotizing encephalo encephalopathy. Straight sinus thrombosis can have involvement of the thalami, but as we saw, the MR venogram was negative. Mitochondrial disorders can have scattered in parts of the deep nuclei and the cortex. Now, uh, ADEM can also have bilateral thalamic involvement, but it does not have this degree of edema uh, and necrosis. And in this case, we don't see any any other white matter involved, any other significant white matter involvement. Uh, acute necrotizing uh, encephalopathy presents with these hemorrhage and peripherally peripherally diffusion restricting and peripherally enhancing areas like we see in this case so this is a rare fulminant encephalopathy which has been described with different viral infections typically with influenza para influenza enteroviruses however more recently a similar imaging appearance has been described with covid-19 although this is more common in children cases can be seen in adults in fact the cases of covid-19 have been described in adults uh there is a genetic predisposition um children who have this ra and bpt gene mutation uh tend to have a predisposition for developing um developing this condition in response to viral infections on imaging as we saw this is characterized by necrotic hemorrhagic lesions of bilateral thalami although they can involve the putamen uh, cerebral and cerebellar white matter as well as the brain stem next case uh is prenatal imaging uh, with abnormal fetal ultrasound and mri at 22 weeks of gestation so we have sagittal axial and coronal t2 haste images from a fetal mri which shows this ovoid relatively well defined mass like lesion in the posterior aspect of the head uh, the lesion is mostly iso intense uh, in t2 signal along the periphery but the central portion has this low t2 signal and and corresponding high t1 signal which is uh, which may suggest uh, either blood products or calcification so what's the diagnosis here if you are thinking in terms of a neoplasm teratoma would be most likely in this age group if you are thinking in terms of uh, vascular malformations vein of kalen mal malformation would be common at this age group is this some kind of a dural sinus malformation or is it hemorrhage within an extra axial mass like an arachnoid cyst let's look at some postnatal imaging before we come to the diagnosis so on the postnatal mri we have this pre contrast t1 weighted image which shows this heterogeneity t1 hyperintense lesion in the posterior aspect of the of, of the cranium centered in the region of the torcular on the post contrast even weighted images we see enhancement of the dural venous sinuses around this uh, this heterogeneous lesion which is suggestive of a large blood blood clot within the dilated torcular we also see gradient susceptibility and diffusion hyperintensity within the lesion like they related to blood products here are some cine images which show that there is dilatation of the dural venous sinuses with this large heterogeneous lesion presumably a blood clot which is centered in the region of torcular as we can see on this post contrast images there is enhancement of the dural venous sinuses around this partially filling blood clot in the region of the torcular So the diagnosis here is dural sinus malformation. Um, it, it's a rare kind of a vascular malformation, and which is different from the more common vein of Kallen malformation. So this is characterized by massive dilatation of the dural sinuses, typically the torcular, although it can involve the sigmoid sinus or the or, or the jugular bulb, and it's associated with mural AV shunting. The AV shunting can be difficult to demonstrate on conventional MRI or MRA, and often requires a catheter angiogram. Uh, this condition is typically diagnosed in the prenatal or the early postnatal period. Uh, 
the the massively enlarged torcular is typically partially thrombosed. The deep venous structures are normal, which will distinguish it from the more common vein of Yellen malformation. The prognosis of the condition depends on the presence and degree of dural AV shunting, and there is a grading system. And the higher the degree of AV shunting, the worse is the prognosis, and worse is the degree of parenchymal changes and hydrocephalus associated with this condition. Uh, again, uh, these depending on the degree of AV shunting, these lesions can spontaneously regress, but more often they require embolization. Next case, case number four is a seven-day-old female who presented with lethargy and poor feeding. On the axial diffusion-weighted images in the top row, we see these symmetric areas of diffusion restriction in bilateral deep cerebellar white matter, the superior cerebellar peduncles, the dorsal aspect of the brainstem, extending into the thalamus, posterior limbs of the internal capsules, corona radiata, and the periorolandic white matter. On the on the ADC map, we see this correspondingly markedly low low signal in the in these areas of the deep cerebellar white matter and the brainstem. Uh, on the T2 weighted images, there is mild hyperintensity and maybe subtle expansion involving the dorsal brainstem and the thalamus. So, what's the diagnosis here uh, in the seven-day-old child? Is it an uh, inborn error of metabolism? Is it related to basilar artery thrombosis? Is it encephalitis, or is it related to hypoglycemia? So this pattern of involvement of the cerebellum, brainstem, and the corticospinal tract is very characteristic of uh, maple syrup urine disease. So maple syrup urine disease is an inborn error of branch and amino acid metabolism. It's typically diagnosed with newborn screen. However, if the diagnosis is not made in the time or if it's not intervened upon, symptoms develop by the end of first week, like we see in this case. This characteristic pattern of edema involves the myelinated structures, and it's because of the intramyelinic or the myelin splitting edema. Uh, these patients can also have a component of basogenic edema due to blood brain barrier breakdown, but the more characteristic imaging appearance is attributed to the intramyelinic edema. Uh, and as we saw in this case, we see marked diffusion restriction. Oftentimes, the ADC values are greater than 50% lower than the normal brain, and it involves the myelinated parenchyma, including the cerebellar white matter, brainstem, and the corticospinal tract. Next case, case number five, is an 18-month-old child who had a history of infantile spasms or West syndrome who presented for an outpatient MRI uh, with about 10 days of hyperkinetic movement. So on the diffusion-weighted images, we see these uh, bilateral areas of diffusion restriction within the thalami. Uh, also, with some involvement of the midbrain, there is involvement of the central tegmental tracts of the pons and also the cerebellar white matter. You can see the pattern of involvement of the deep nuclei and the brainstem on this coronal DWI image. On the ADC map, we see the corresponding low signal in bilateral thalami, and there is this mildly expansivity to hyperintensity. Uh, on the post contrast images, there is no associated enhancement within these areas. So, what's the diagnosis here? Is it ADEM? Is it some kind of a metabolic disease? Is it related to a drug toxicity or is it related to osmotic demyelination? So diagnosis in this case is by gabapentin associated reversible MRI changes. So this child had history of infantile spasms and was being treated with by Uh ADEM can again have um, thalamic involvement, uh, but also there would be a history of viral prodrome, prodrome and uh, the, the child would be more symptomatic. Metabolic di disorders, uh, can have a similar pattern, but again, the child would be more symptomatic. Osmotic demyelination uh, uh, would present acutely with uh, history of electrolyte uh, imbalances or some underlying conditions. So, vicabetrin is a common drug which is used for treatment of seizures, particularly infantile spasms, um, and it can also be used for patients with tuberous sclerosis. It's a GABA transaminase inhibitor. MRI changes are very common with, with treatment and in seen in up to 22 to 32% of the patient and often with relatively mild or no clinical symptoms. As we saw in this case, this was a this was an outpatient MRI for relatively mild clinical symptoms. Uh, the this appearance is more common in children under two years of, of age, and the MRI findings, the incidence of MRI findings is uh, dose dependent. Uh, on MRI, as we saw in this case, there is symmetric diffusion restriction within the deep nuclei, brainstem, and the dentate nuclei. And the findings are typically reversible over a few months and sometimes even with continued treatment. Uh, 
So the important point to note here is these characteristic MRI findings in a relatively unsymptomatic infant with seizures should prompt a review of the drug history. <laughs> Case number six is a two-month-old child who presented with a scalp lump in the midline parietal region. Initial ultrasound showed a hypoechoic lesion in the scalp with surrounding subcutaneous soft tissue thickening. There was this uh, hypoechoic tract which appears to extend intracranially, and this is the uh, color Doppler flow within the dural venous sinuses which appear patent. Uh, on the subsequent MR imaging, we see this fluid-filled elongated tract extending from the pineal system all the way up to this bony defect in the parietal bone. And in the subcutaneous tissue, there is this heterogeneous uh, um, heterogeneous T2 signal with some fluid signal uh, proliferation of fat and some heterogeneous uh, fibrotic change. Uh, on the post-contrast images, again, we see this um, fluid-filled tract extending all the way uh, up to the parietal bone defect and extracranially. There is also this abnormality of the of the dural sinuses with this vertically oriented sinus which extends along the anterior aspect of the tract. On the MR venogram images, we see this abnormal vertically oriented sinus, uh, sinus which is related to abnormal orientation of the straight sinus and the persistent thylacine sinus. And on this coronal projection, we see this um, uh, this kind of a filling defect in the uh, in the superior sagittal sinus, which is related to focal fenestration of the superior sagittal sinus from this fluid-filled tract, bisecting it to extend to the parietal bone. So, what's the diagnosis here? Is it an atrotic cephalocele? Is it a dermoid with intracranial tract? Is it a lymphatic malformation with intracranial extension, or is it sinus pericranial? So this is a case of atrotic cephalocele. Dermoids can also have a subcutaneous mass with intracranial extension, although they are they are more common in the occipital lobe and also they won't have these associated parenchymal changes. Uh, lymphatic malformation can have underlying bony involvement, but it's unusual to have an appearance like this. Sinus pericrania is is dilated veins with intra and extracranial communication and typically uh, it would occur in this parietal location however they won't have the parenchymal changes as we see in this case so atletic parietal cephalocin is a rare kind of neural tube defect although it accounts for about 38 to 50 percent of all cephalocin uh, the subcutaneous lesion or the subcutaneous mass contains meninges and vestigial tissues sometimes neural and glial tissues but there is no frank herniation of brain parenchyma the characteristic imaging findings are this cigar-shaped CSF cleft, which extends from uh, from the midline in the pineal or the supracerebellar system all the way up to the extracranial lesion. And also there is elevation or the spinning top appearance of the tentorium with an enlarged supracerebellar system. Um, uh, also there is abnormalities of the dural venous sinuses with a vertically oriented sinus, which can be related to the straight sinus or the persistent falcine sinus. Um, this condition can also be associated with other intracranial abnormalities, so be on the lookout for that, like corpusculosum abnormalities, um, cortical malformations, and ventriculomegaly. Next case, uh, case number seven, is a four-day-old child who presented with a prenatal diagnosis of severe hydrocephalus. So we have sagittal T1 and T2-weighted MR imaging, which shows the severe ventriculomegaly um, and also, when you look at the brainstem, there is hypoplasia of the brainstem, particularly the pons, with this abnormal Z-shaped or kinked appearance of the brainstem. The tectum is somewhat prominent. There is also hypoplasia of the cerebellum with partially fluid fossil posterior fossa. On the axial images, the cerebellum appears malformed with this lobular, uh, lobular contours. Uh, the, the, the supra supratentorial brain parenchyma also appears abnormal with lack of sulcation, given the lesion cephalic appearance. And also when you look at the cortex, it has this lobular lumpy bumpy uh, lumpy bumpy appearance uh, bilaterally. Again, same findings uh, on the coronal T2 weighted imaging. Uh, images through the orbits show these linear uh, sh show these linear T2 hypointense uh, Tracks which extend from the posterior aspect of the lens all the way up to the up to the fundus, which is suggestive of a PHPV or a persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous. So, what's the diagnosis here? Is it a congenital muscular dystrophy? Is it pontine tegmental cap dysplasia? Is it Gomez-Lopez-Hernandez syndrome, or is it 
all sequelae to congenital CMV infection. So this constellation of imaging findings is very characteristic of congenital muscular dystrophy spectrum, the, the, the prototype of which is the walker warburg syndrome, uh, which this uh, patient had. So what is congenital muscular dystrophy syndrome? Th this, is a, this is a spectrum of autosomal recessive muscular uh, uh, dystrophy syndromes. Uh, some of them have names like Fukuyama, uh, muscle eye brain disease or walker borg syndrome. The walker borg tends to be the most severe of the, of the muscular dystrophy spectrum. These are also called as alpha dystroglyconopathies because of the metabolic defect, defect affecting the, 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 the dystroglycan molecules, which is found in multiple tissues, including the muscle CNS and the ocular tissues. Uh, on imaging, uh, you may not be able to make a make the diagnosis of a specific subtype and you can call this a walker warburg phenotype or you can call it alpha dystroglyconopathy the characteristic imaging features as we saw in this case include a king and a hypoplastic brainstem hypoplastic cerebellum with dysplastic cerebellar parenchyma often with microcyst there are typically myelination defects uh, the supratentorial brain parenchyma demonstrates cobblestone lesion cephaly. There is associated moderate or severe ventricular megaly. There can be corpusculosum dysgenesis. And there are ocular anomalies, like in our case, we saw PHPV, but it could also be associated with morning glory disc anomaly. Next case, case number eight, is a two year old child who presented with new onset seizure and a frontal lobe mass on uh, outside hospital CT imaging. So on this initial non-contrast head CT, we see this hyperdense mass in the anterior midline straddling the fox cerebri and involving bilateral medial frontal lobes. Uh, on the subsequent MRI, we see corresponding gradient susceptibility uh, in this region. On the flare images, there is subtle hyperintensity and expansion of the, of the medial frontal cortex on both sides of the fox. Uh, uh, the diffusion weighted images are essentially normal. There may be some cortical thickening, but no diffusion restriction. Um, and this is post contrast flare imaging, and you can compare it to the pre contrast flare imaging. So there is some enhancement of the cortex and bilateral medial frontal lobe, although most strikingly, there is enhancement of the leptomeningeal structures in the involved areas. And, and post contrast flare imaging is a very useful technique, um, especially for brain tumors. Um, and we, we, we have this whenever we give contrast within the flare sequence post contrast and I would stra strongly recommend you do that at least for the brain tumor patient. Uh, this is the post contrast even weighted imaging which again shows this ill-defined enhancement within the cortex and the electromeninges. So what's the diagnosis here? Is it a meningioma? Is it meningioangiomatosis? Is it a hemangiopericytoma or is it cavernoma? So this imaging appearance is suggestive of meningioangiomatosis. Uh, meningiomas yeah, are also extra axial lesions, but typically they don't have an infiltrative cortical component and leptomeningeal enhancement like we see in this case. Hemangiopericytomas also tend to be more extra axial. Cavernomas can have the hyperdensity like we saw on the CT here, but they would typically have um, the popcorn appearance with more heterogeneous internal signal on T2-weighted images. So what is meningioangiomatosis? It's a rare benign uh, lesion um, which is centered in the cortex. It's probably a hematomatous lesion. Uh, th this is common in frontal and temporal lobes and often presents with headaches and seizures. Uh, about 25% of these cases are associated with NF2. Uh, and the patients who have associated NF2 present early and can have multiple lesions. So although the mean age for diagnosis for meningioangiomatosis is in early adulthood, the pediatric cases which we see are most commonly associated with NF2. It's a cortically based calcified lesion and enhancement is very common. Uh, on histopathological uh, exam, there is cortical infiltration, there is very vascular meningocelial proliferation and a lot of sonoma bodies. And these, these features can help distinguish it from other conditions like vascular malformation and meningioma, which may be suspected based on imaging. Uh, next case, and I think it's my last case, is a four-year-old child who presented with papilledema. On the uh, on the initial MR imaging, on the axial and coronal T2 weighted images, we see these multifocal areas of rounded T2 hyperintensities, almost just like changes scattered throughout the uh, cerebellar hemispheres, um, as you can see here on the coronal images as well. On the post-contrast imaging, there is some leptomeningeal enhancement corresponding to these areas. 
but it's more prominently seen on the surface of the brain stem and extending all the way over the surface of the cervical spinal cord. We also did the spine imaging at the same time and the spinal cord again on the T2 weighted imager shows these multiple areas of uh, rounded T2 hyperintense or cystic lesions throughout the spinal cord and on the post contrast imaging there is thick nodular leptomeningeal enhancement throughout the spinal cord extending all the way to the conus medullaris and also along the cordae equina and the thecal sac terminus. So what's the diagnosis here? Is it cryptococcal meningitis? Is it neurocystis sarcosis? Is it some kind of a disseminated tumor? Or is it related to neurocutaneous melanosis? So this is an example of a diffuse leptomeningeal glioneuronal tumor. Uh, oftentimes, uh, at the initial presentation, it can be confused with atypical infections like neurocystis sarcosis or tuberculosis. Uh, but, but, but the patient had no clinical findings of infection, no prior history, uh, and, and the CSF was negative for infections too. Uh, neurocutaneous melanosis can also present with diffuse septomeningeal involvement of the brain and spine. However, it typically does not have the T2 hyperintensity changes as we see here. And also, neurocutaneous melanosis has intrinsic T1 hyperintense signal typically in the cerebellum and medial temporal lobe because of the melanin deposition. So what's diffuse leptomeningeal glioneuronal tumor? It's a newly defined tumor entity. It's a mixed neuronal glial tumor, which was um, described by WHO in 2016. It's characterized by this diffuse leptomeningeal thickening and enhancement with multifocal small cystic appearing lesions in, throughout the brain and spinal cord. So the imaging appearance, uh, which we are seeing here, is pretty characteristic of this diffuse leptomeningeal glioneuronal tumor. Although, although sometimes it can also present with focal masses, particularly in the spinal cord. And like I said, it can be confused with atypical infections. So awareness of this disease entity can help you make a more accurate diagnosis and direct the clinicians in the appropriate direction. Uh, so to summarize, we saw a couple of examples of each of the different etiopathological groups in the infectious inflammatory category. We saw parechovirus meningoencephalitis, which presents with this characteristic linear and ovoid diffusion restriction within the white matter. We saw acute necrotizing encephalopathy, which is a complication of viral infections and presents with very fulminant necrotic lesions in the thalami. Uh, in the vascular category, we saw dural sinus malformation, which is an uncommon, uh, 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 which is an uncommon uh, kind of a vascular malformation, which is characterized by this massive aneurysmal dilatation of the torcular with associated neural AV shunting. In the toxic metabolic category, we saw maple syrup urine disease, which has this characteristic pattern of involvement of the myelinated white matter, demonstrating diffusion restriction and with presence early on in life. Uh, then we saw vigabacin associated changes. This is this is something which is fairly common um, in uh, in kids who are being treated with vigabacin for seizures. And th this is typically not, th these kids are typically not very symptomatic and the condition is reversible, sometimes even with continuation of vigabacin. In the congenital category, we saw the parietal atrotic cephalocy, where we have the CSF filled tract, which communicates with this small extracranial um, cranial soft tissue abnormality and can be associated with uh, this abnormally oriented vertical dural venous sinus. We saw the congenital muscular dystrophy spectrum, which is characterized by brainstem hypoplasia and the skin appearance and can have multiple other intracranial and ocular abnormalities. And lastly, in the tumor category, we saw meningeal which is this cortically based infiltrative mass with associated leptomeningeal involvement. And we also saw diffuse leptomeningeal glioneuronal tumor, which is a newly described tumor entity, which is characterized by disseminated disease in the brain and spine. So with that, I thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me.
this uh, talk on uh, pediatric cases uh, and interesting diagnosis, we come to an end of uh, today's prelude. And uh, with this, uh, I request you once again to register for the upcoming MRI teaching course. And I already mentioned it's a comprehensive five day course, which we are going to be covering all the basics to advanced topics related to MRI, including physics, including anatomy, which will be on 7th and 8th of August. Registration links are shared in the chat box, so you can take from there. Even on social media platforms, we have shared the links. One day we'll have complete session on neuro topics. Second day will be complete MSK coverage. And the third day will be on body imaging topic. These lectures uh, plus uh, added prelude sessions will be there. So almost we'll be uh, taking during these four or five days around 80 plus lecture topics. We invite you to please uh, submit your papers and post a presentation and be a part of the event. We are thankful to our educational partners, Sanrad, Bears, Fujifilm, and uh, CareStream for their constant support. Uh, we are thankful to Vivier Imaging. Uh, this is the entire organizing committee. We are here to guide you through the registration process if you have uh, any doubts or facing any issues during the same. And there are many more conferences in line uh, from Indian radiologists, and we have uh, options of uh, also wonderful discounts when you register for these uh, in totality. So please uh, do visit our website to get the details. We'll have a prelude session today evening again 7 p.m. So if you wish to attend these topics, you can rejoin today evening as well. And there's a question in the chat box about the timing of uh, injection during triple phase uh, examination. So we have uh, received the answers from the expert. Uh, that the best way is to go through bolus tracking uh, approach only as we do in CT scan. So similarly, we have bolus tracking uh, softwares and sequences in MR and if possible with pressure injector. Otherwise, most of the places uh, we don't have pressure injectors for MR imaging. So by bolus tracking, we have to take uh, acquire multiphasic images where we should not miss the early arterial and late arterial phase and then uh, aim to acquire the venous phase in both portal venous and delayed. In cases of lesions like cholangio, even the 10 minutes and delayed phases like 40 minutes delayed may be important. So based upon the situation, you can plan your uh, MR uh, phases and later on also take additional delays in two planes. So with this, uh, we come to an end of this prelude and uh, hope to see you all soon. Uh, stay tuned. Next Sunday also, we'll have fresh uh, prelude with two more topics uh, of interest. And uh, let's meet uh, for the main conference on 7th of August. Thank you all.